Welcome back to Over the Air, IoT Connected Devices and the Journey. My name is Ryan Prosser, CEO of Vary, and today we're joined by Nathan Dick, Chief Product Officer at Nanoleaf. We're going to be talking about what it's like at a consumer IoT company to be dancing with elephants, with the big guys in the industry. Nathan, thanks uh, so much for being on the show. Thanks for having me, Ryan. So it's holiday season here in the United States for those that uh, whose calendar kind of revolves around Christmas. So we're, we're having, you know, we do our annual focus on consumer IoT, which is cool. We don't usually have a lot of consumer IoT folks on the show. I'm a big fan of Nanoleaf. I've known of you guys for a while now, a uh, fan of the product. For those that don't know, tell us a little bit about what you guys are all about and the products you make. Sure. So Nanoleaf, we're, we're best known for our wall panels. Uh, you can see them on my, on my wall, I think, depending on how the crop goes. We've also got a number of other ones that go on the wall lines, which I think, oh, that's elements that uh, Ryan's showing. Um, and I think he, he's also got the lines box. So we call that smart decor. We've kind of defined the category, uh, to be honest, but uh, we're generally speaking, we're a smart lighting company, consumer smart home company as well. Yeah, that's that's the quick pitch. I'm going to ask you more later about what it's like to define a category. I, I said to Nathan previously that they say flattery is the highest form of compliment, but it never feels that way in the moment. You know, it can be very infuriating to watch others copy what you've done. Talk to me a little bit about, so like, I'd like to address that, but let's go back to origin stories first. I always, consumer IoT companies only the strong survive. It is not easy for, for companies to make it from zero to something. Talk to me a little bit about zero to something here. Like wh what were the early days look like for my company? You know, we're a services company in the hardware space. So Very, the company underwriting the show, it took about five years for our company to really figure out who we were and get serious. What did it look like at Nanoleaf? Sure. So, I mean, I can definitely share that story a little bit uh, and I'll also kind of pepper in where I entered the picture because I'm not, I'm not a co-founder, I've not been, not been there from the beginning. But uh, the three co-founders, Jimmy, Christian and Tom, they, they met together on the solar car team at the University of Toronto. Jimmy, who's now the CEO, he was probably the intern on the solar car team. And Tom, he's our PhD mastermind. Uh, he was he was the whip cracker telling all the, uh, the peons what to do. But um, they all have a passion for sustainable technology. They, they got together around 2019, sorry, 2009, working on this, what they called the nano grid. It was this off grid power supply plus solar panel, um, plus a digital interface. And it was supposed to be for an off grid application. You know, there's lots of challenges. Uh, I feel, feel like those products are finally coming to market within the last couple of years. But in that process, they built this, this light bulb it's the world's most energy efficient light bulb, and they kickstarted it. This was in 2013, and it's literally what kickstarted Nanoleaf. So this light bulb, world's most energy efficient light bulb, we weren't connected or smart at that point. It was just a really, really energy efficient light bulb. Folded PCB, so very, very unique design. It kind of kickstarted the next couple of years. So fast forward to 2015, which is when we started to get close to smart home as it is today. I think what really took us or, or kind of pushed us into that connected space, having been in, you know, the non-connected space is, is voice control. Um, so HomeKit was actually first with voice control. I don't think a lot of people know that, but uh, definitely Alexa with their Echo uh, took that mainstream much more fast, much more quickly. So yeah, 2015, we were working on a Zigbee product. Uh, it was a hub plus a, a light bulb. That light bulb was basically derived from that very first, you know, really, really energy efficient light bulb. So it was black this time. Uh, I feel like Ryan said before, he doesn't like white, he prefers it black. But uh, yeah, black light bulb, black hub, worked with HomeKit, uh, wasn't color at that time. And we thought we were going to be first to market with HomeKit because HomeKit was announced 2014, you know, just as a spec, you know, come manufacturers, build some products around it. 2015, spec was, was supposed to be ready for consum consumption. So we had this, you know, hub and light bulb combo uh, that we brought to market. Yeah, that product's never really took off for us. Some stiff competition from Philips Hue as, as well as a variety of others on the market. But where we really hit our stride is with our panels. So the panels, the way that they were born out, it was like, it was 2015, end of 2015, we were gonna go to CES, show this new product uh, in this hub and light bulb. And we had this little like prototype. So an industrial designer had, had, had worked it up and going back and forth, like humming and hawing. And 
we we're like, this is kind of cool, but we don't know if it's going to be like viable. So we took it to CES 2016 uh, in January and we showed it off and uh, we were at CES and this like smallest booth you could find at CES. If you've ever been, it's a massive, massive trade floor and there's actually two of them. The biggest one is where the Samsungs of the world are and, and the automakers. And then there's the smaller one that's called Sans. And we were the smallest of the small, like the back corner booth, the smallest booth you could get in Sans. The only saving grace, and this is ironic, but we were, we were right beside a bathroom. So people sort of had to come by our booth, but uh, we had our panels on the wall, um, you know, obviously showing our real product that had just come to market. And the panels were the star. Like it was literally a, a Northern star for people walking by. When they saw these panels, they were just wowed. They had, you know, dynamic effects going. And we caught the eye of CNET. Um, so CNET, obviously a very prominent consumer publisher. Uh, they always talk about, you know, what they love about CES. And we were one of the darlings in 2016. So we spun it around, brought it to market it, nine months later. And I mean, I'd say the rest is history. There's lots of history to go, to go on. But uh, yeah, yeah, I bet. And, and when you say panels, that's different than this product I'm holding here, which is the Elements product, correct. right? Yeah. So the so we've had a number of iterations. That- a number of iterations since then. So we, we started with what we called the Aurora. We later changed that name to the light panels. From the light panels, we went, we added a rhythm module. So it added, you know, music functionality about a year later. Later, Then we added square panels, which we call a canvas. They are still available today. And then we later introduced what we call the shapes, which is our hexagon squares, sorry, hexagons, triangles, and small triangles. And what you had in your hand there, the elements, very similar to the shapes. It's just a wooden veneer on top. It does not have full color. It just has tunable white. So it's kind of gained, sorry, aimed at more of a, a subtle interior decor statements. Um, you know, something that my, th- so these things are artistically beautiful. My son goes nuts for these. So we have them set up in his room and you can touch them and they, they look and feel, you know, for folks of a certain age, you'll remember the children's toy, uh, Simon from the eighties or nineties, you know, you could touch it and patterns would emerge. And then as a kid, you know, you would replicate that pattern and see how far you could get. And my understanding is that you, in the app, you're able to kind of replicate that. And he loves it. So it's, it's sound activated. So if he's, you know, making noise, playing, whatever, it kind of replicates, it lights up and it's to, I don't know, in harmony with the, the music or the sound, you can touch it. And so you can interact with it. And then it just looks really nice. And my question is, I mean, one of the things about NanoLeaf that I think is fascinating, I, I've not seen anybody else pull this off. You know, listen, we all just heard the origin story. So the origin story is born out of, what, I mean, what are some of the key takeaway audience? I hear things like most efficient light bulb of ever, you know, and you know, very engineering driven accomplishments. Maybe engineers out there nodding their head. Oh yeah, I track this. I understand these things. And then you flash forward and and this is a very beautiful product. I mean, I would use the word beautiful as like a deliberate uh, adjective. This is, you were clearly going for something that is visually striking. And I don't mean to, you know, make, to poke at my engineer friends here, but that's not generally what engineers are known for. They hype, you know, they're, they're looking for, to, to optimize for, uh, you know, measurable things. I wouldn't say that like necessarily artistic beauty is the thing that they're optimizing for. And yet that's the outcome. How culturally did you guys make that leap? Because it feels enormous and it, and it could not have been accidental. Was there a deliberate moment where someone, one of these founders perhaps, or you said, guys, if this, it can't, it's not about efficiency. Beauty has nothing to do with functionality. Beauty has to do with something at a more emotional level. You tell me, is it, what, what happened over at NanoLeaf that caused what seems to be a DNA level change? Yeah, I mean, I. I think you nailed, hit the nail on the head for us. The start was very engineering focused, like very, how do we, how do we save energy? You know, whether it's at the light bulb, whether it's, you know, a sustainable off-grid application. I would say the same is, is actually for my, my trajectory. I, I did a, a master's in material science. I, I worked on solar stuff before I was at Nanoleaf. And so over time, I've, I've also seen a shift in my thinking, you know, I'll, I'll probably come back to it, but yeah. so. I think the very first thing is like that story about how CES kickstarted, or I shouldn't say kickstarted, like kind of launched our, our wall panel, our wall arts. Before that happened, we had an industrial designer working on it and thinking creatively about like, 
how do these pieces come together? So that's, that's a big part of it. But as we, as we've moved forward, you know, we've really pushed into this interactivity, right? So like out of the gate, right? You, you put RGB things on the wall and to make them look beautiful, it is actually a form of art. You know, you can do any sort of sequence of flashing colors. They don't all look nice together. So, so we, we've had that from the very get go. We've had those designers, like the real creatives. And actually this is, this is maybe a, you know, a circumstance of where we're located. So we're, we're located in downtown Toronto. We have the uh, Ontario Center for Arts and Design. I believe that's how it's, what it stands for, OCAD. And there's just so much great design talent that comes out of OCAD. So we've, we have a number of people on our team that come from there and we're trained, you know, professionally in, in art. And they work alongside of our engineers, you know, people coming from Waterloo, who are very well re renowned school, uh, University of Toronto, Queens, McMaster, like we, there's a lot of great engineering talent around where we are located. But yeah, that confluence of art and engineering is something that obviously has been born out of our products. And more recently, we've been very intentional about like, this is what is part of our DNA. This is what's part of our mission and, and how we do things internally at Nanoleaf. So one of the pieces that gets born out, you know, we, we now have an annual hackathon. It's a good place for like a little letting off steam and, and not working on the pressures of the day to day. Uh, we just finished one uh, last week. And, you know, in those hackathons, our team can kind of really, really work together in places where they don't always, you know, collaborate. Um, and that again is, is the, art, the artists, the designers with, with the engineers, the developers. So, yeah, I think bringing it also back to my, my personal trajectory is like when I started at Nanoleaf, my first responsibility besides launching that first product, which kind of fell in my lap, but my first responsibility was actually to, to draft this proposal for a federal funding funding agency around a sustainable technology. It's basically taking what we built with our, our light bulb and throwing it out and extrapolating it with wireless controls, which was Zigbee and saving energy in a variety of applications. And to do that, you have to do occupancy sensor sensing, daylight sensing, you know, it's basically what smart lighting should be. And I was like, yeah, we're going to save energy. There's this, this amount, you know, it's on the paper. We're going to, we're going to, it's going to be amazing. But I've come to realize it's like for consumers, especially, you know, they're not going to buy it just because it saves a little, a few extra dollars. They want to buy it because it's beautiful, because it, it's a great experience. And that experience thing, I, I truly believe is, is missing in smart lighting today. We're trying to solve that, but, you know, bringing, tying that back to our panels, You've got the, the beautiful lights that co get choreographed together. You have them dance to music, which is also a separate art in itself. You know, we layered on touch uh, when we introduced Canvas, like you said, so you can touch the panels and inter interact with them. You can actually play, you know, little games like Simon or a very, you know, simplistic form of, of Pac-Man. And, and yeah, all of that comes together into a product that people just love. All of the, the engineering, all of the, the problems that had to be solved, they fade into the background and, and they're just the mm -hmm. supporting cast. Uh, let's take this forward a little bit. I promised the audience we were gonna talk a little bit about dancing with elephants. So you guys have built this, let's call it amazing mousetrap. You know, I say often in tech, like the best mousetrap doesn't win folks. There's a lot of other factors in play. You guys built this great mousetrap. Okay, let's take the mouse analogy forward here. So now, you know, you're mice dancing with elephants. There's just a few giant names in the heart smart home space. Names like Amazon and Google come to mind, but of course, Apple as well. It feels like if you're making a device that's going to interact, um, of course, this is the world pre matter, which has changed things uh, to some degree. We're not going to get into matter too much today. That's like its own episode series. But you guys don't have a lot of control. Certain things just kind of come from on high from other companies. What is that like? You know, I mean, that feels unbelievably nerve wracking to me that the decisions made in other private enterprises, famously secretive other enterprises, are going to have huge impacts on uh, what you're building and, and some of the, the code behind it, the firmware behind it. What does that look like? And specifically, if you could talk to the folks out in the audience that are themselves at consumer IOT companies trying to learn from and, and uh, maybe even become comfortable with that risk. What does that look like from you guys and what lessons have you learned? First off on, on the matter side, I feel like I've come back to it because it matter is, is like, it, as far as dancing with elephants goes, it's, it's uh, I don't know, it could be a podcast in itself. Um, it totally, but, yep. <laughs> but the, uh, 
yeah, the first kind of instance or exposure I got to dancing with elephants was was pretty much when I started. Uh, you know, I already talked about that, that proposal, but this Zigbee Hub uh, light bulb combo was our first product. I kind of just kind of came into the product management role just because I saw the gap and like I'm like this has to happen. But the uh, that product, like I said, HomeKit was announced as a specification in 2014. So we're like, hey, let's build this bulb build our bulb into into Zigbee and, and put something onto HomeKit because voice control is awesome. Um, it, it honestly is. 2015, I, you guys, anyone who's, who's followed Apple, they are historically very, very tight-lipped. They don't tell anyone what they're doing as much as they can unless it gets leaked in a bar. You know, WWDC is where they kind of take the wraps off of kind of the holiday season you know, into the second half of the year. So we were expecting, okay, HomeKit's coming, you know, next version of iOS will be supported. There will be an Apple Home app. This is like the center aggregator app where everything gets controlled. And 2015 WWDC is like, HomeKit's going to be launched. There will be no app. And we had to pivot, right? We had no app ready. We had no app developers on staff. And so we had to like, we had to find a, an app developer house to, to help us. And, you know, we're still a fledgling startup with without product market fits don't have lots of cash on hand so so we you know we basically bootstrapped sort of shoestring budget getting an app out the door and that was my like trial by fire for product management it's like I, I, the stuff that they gave us was just not good enough and like you know really trying to push it forward and and whatever it took to get that to market because because yeah it was uh you know end of 2015 i, I can't remember how many months it had been from from launching our last product you know i remember in november or in october we were trying to get this thing certified and this is another piece of like dancing with the elephant if if you will the number of dependencies it's like you get past one you get past another you get you run into another then suddenly something pops up you didn't even know about but we had to get certified for mfi this is the home kit certification in order to purchase chips required to actually build the products there's a little bit of you know leeway in terms of order of events so you can you can actually launch it reasonably but uh yeah we're trying to like solve some last issues to get certified and and they're around connectivity and like i don't know smart home connectivity is a is an entirely different beast it's an absolute mess of permutations and combinations of things you can't possibly all test and shit so we're trying to figure this last issue out and it's like we're going super late into each night and like basically burning the candle at both ends and the engineer was like, can we just pick this up tomorrow? And I remember specifically being like, no, guys, like, we can't. Like, if we don't launch this before the holiday season, like, we might not have jobs. This is just, like, how things go, right? And and they just looked at me, like, wide-eyed, like they'd never thought of it. And I'm like, oh, yeah. It was just getting whatever whatever needed to be done all in response to, to all of these extra external dependencies. There's a lot of other stories I could certainly share. So t taking where... this forward a little bit i i curious i mean i love the urgency there which i think too often technology companies are afraid to uh i think especially you know in the last couple of years it's been about uh i don't know employee perks and things like that you know and there's been uh kind of a shyness to drive urgency and say listen folks we've got to we've got to get this thing done you know, I think Steve Jobs got that. I think Elon Musk gets that. Um, not that these were were our, our perfect leaders, but that was something that, that they leaned on to really drive things forward. Talk to me a little bit about, you know, I love to ask leaders about what I call the wrong side of impossible. This idea that any great technology company has solved a hard technical problem, either that had never been solved before, or they're offering it at, at, you know, at a different, a totally different price point than people had seen before, something like that. What, what did that look like for Nanoleaf? Like, what did, you, was there a moment that you felt like, or maybe it was just what you were referencing there, but like, guys, we got to get this thing done or we're in real trouble here. Is that the story you just told or, or does something else come to mind of a time that you, you know, feel like, look, folks, we've got to take this hill. This is critical for us. Yeah, I mean, as far as like a specific instance, that's maybe as close as it gets to like a very specific story. Like, here's a day, a moment in time. I, I think like looking back in retrospect, you know, what we've built with our light panels, people see it as beauty, beauty and sometimes pe see people see the price tag and wish it was less expensive. 
but they also don't know how much work has gone into building that and like how hard it was actually to solve those play those those problems to make it you know something that made sense so i mean we've we've obviously protected that technology we have a number of patents granted around it there have been copycats like you, you alluded to earlier in the show and you know i guess there's a form of flattery you know obviously there's validation that the market, the niche that we've been that we've built is large enough to be worth copying, but there's the level of experience that we've built and the ease of, of configuration and like you just put them on the wall, you connect them up, and it's it. Like our controller, we always have like manual controls built in, um, so you can just like you can just take off. You don't even need to download the app if you don't want to. Um, but of course, the app gives you much more in terms of you know, sharing scenes with others, building scenes yourself, to, you know, downloading those that, that others, other creators have built, and of course being connected up to all of the other smart home services like Apple, Amazon, and Google. So yeah, I mean, as far as the wrong side of impossible goes, I think another thing to point out is our team always operates on the bleeding edge, the cutting edge, if you will, of technology. I don't know if this is the original meaning of it, but like I call it the bleeding edge because our team actually does bleed because we're there. But it's it's a you know it's a pain that's worth the gain, and that's something that's been kind of built into us from from the get go, and it's something that continues to carry us forward. So we've pulled a lot of the past out of you today. Give us a look forward. You know the cool thing about Bleeding Edge, I mean, look, the worst thing about Bleeding Edge is looking backwards, and you're like, God, it has been difficult, and we have literally bled to be here where we are to get to this place. The cool thing is the future, you know, this is where we're going. Give us a look ahead, you know, so 23 is on the horizon as we sit here today recording this November of 2022. What are we going to see from NanoLeaf in 23 and beyond? Yeah, I mean, I'll come back to Matter. I know, I know you uh, don't want to dive too deep and I won't deep dive that deep, but Matter um, is an important part of the last three years, you know, from 2019 when it was announced as Project Chip uh, to now when it's just been announced and we have a number of products coming to market with Matter. So those are definitely coming um, early 2022, as we've already announced last week, um, or what was the week before now. We also just announced our, our, our lines Square, which is the lines with a Square connector that gives you a little more de de design flexibility. But on the Matter front, like I, and I've written about this before, but I, I see Matter as a, as a new foundation. It's a really needed foundation, like the amount of work we've had to put in over the last seven years to make sure all of our products work with all of the people that matter in the space. It's just been tremendous. And it's like, it's literally been many, many more ways to turn on a light bulb. So having Matter as the single way where, you know, Apple, Amazon, Google, Samsung, all of the new entrants in the future expect to turn on a light bulb, that is like, I don't know why it hasn't existed until now. Um, I mean, there's there's a lot of good reasons, um, and that's why Matter exists. It's why it's been built. But yeah, that foundation of Matter, it's just a foundation. Like no one comes to see a house because it has a rock solid foundation. They want to see what's the what's, what's built on top, and that's what is coming next. So I talked, you know, alluded to it a little bit around the experience of smart home automation, smart lighting, in particular. You know, voice control is great. You know, I don't want to yell at my across the, the room every single time I want to turn on the lights or off the lights. App control, obviously very, very necessary and, and you know, can be an elevator to elevate that experience. It can also be getting in the way, like you don't want to pull out your smartphone to turn off your lights. So the switch, that still kind of is where people gravitate towards. It's, it's been, you know, programmed into their, their, their psyches. I want to get to a place where smart lighting is so smart and so automated that you don't have to touch the switch. The lights are just there. They're on when you need them. They're off and, you know, or dim or whatever when, when you're not around. The, you know, the color can react to what you've shown or your preference to be over the, over the last whatever. And it's just, it's like the helpful home. It's like whenever someone imagines a futuristic movie with smart lighting, it's like the lights kind of, it, it just all works, right? And that's not what it is today. It's just a cobble work, if that's a word. So that's coming we're working hard on that. We've got some pretty cool stuff on the on the artistic side too. So so look for that. I, I think CES 2023 will be on the ground there. So you know, if you guys want to check out what we have to show, we'll be like, we'll be taking off the wraps. Boy, we're gonna have to provide the audience with coordinates because CES has gotten. I mean, it's been big for a while, but it is big 
So you guys yeah. let us know where you're going to be when it rolls around and we will keep the audience updated so they can find you. Last sure. question. You gave me a great segue about 40 seconds ago. I think you said something like folks in the space. Who else is doing good work out here? You know, so you guys are, I don't know how many Canadians we've had on the show. I don't think enough. That's for sure. You know, who's doing good work in tech? What are you seeing that you think not enough people are, are talking about or that you're liking that you think, you know, maybe the public verdict is not, you don't agree with, you, you have a more positive view on it? Yeah, I mean, definitely a place where there's not a lot of love happening right now is is around Meta. I personally really like the Quest Pro. I, I don't own it yet. Um, I don't know if I'll buy it, actually, to be honest. From my personal perspective, like my history, I, I really love optical technologies. So like solar panels, you know, LEDs, things that are actually a little more advanced than LEDs or solar panels. So, so like AR goggles, AR glasses, you know, there used to be a, or there is a company that w called North that got acquired by Google. They're, they're out of Waterloo in Canada. But anyway, I believe in the future of at least AR and mixed, mixed reality. Um, I think VR play, you know, plays a role. I, I personally get a little bit sick when I play VR games, depending on what type of game it is. Having said that, I played this game on Quest called The Room. VR, or I can't remember, it's got some extra naming around it. Just amazing. Like, it's this, this puzzle game, you know, born out of the iPad originally, and then it came to VR. If you haven't played this on Quest, I would say, like, you got to play it on Quest, uh, Quest 2, which is the consumer grade. But yeah, Quest Pro, you know, Meta, obviously, they just laid off a whole bunch of employees, obviously, in the, in the toilet, in the stock market. But I, I see Zuckerberg and his his vision of the future, right? And there's a lot of components of the metaverse, which are, I mean, they, they'll appeal to some people, but it'll be niche. But the virtual workspaces and his the way he speaks about presence, you know, I think that really resonates for me. Like, you know, here we're talking, we're, we're you know, through this, this 2, 2D screen. Imagine in the future doing podcast interviews sitting beside on, someone on a virtual couch without having to fly across the country and massive waste of, I shouldn't say waste, but it, it is a, an enormous cost for energy, for airfare and, and, and whatnot. But there's a lot to believe there. And I, I think like, you know, I look about, look at places of innovation. Innovation very rarely happens in like the largest, largest of organizations. This is like the innovator's dilemma 101. There's stories of like the iPod, right? This was, if you've read Tony Fidel's new book called Bill, he kind of chronicles the story of the iPod among, or the iPod among other things. But it was like this small little team in Apple and like Tony was running it and you know, it had the blessing of Steve Jobs. So that certainly helps, but it was a small team in Apple. Apple was doing the Mac and, and all this other stuff. And I think we're coming back, coming back to Meta is like, I feel like they're trying to find that small team to do the really interesting next thing. And it just so happens that Zuckerberg wants to personally be on that team. So, you know, he's, whether that's all of the decisions business-wise are, are the best, I don't know. I'm not, I'm not qualified for that, but <laughs> yeah. I think One of the things I find fascinating is the times when there's a first mover advantage and the times when there's a second mover advantage. And Zuckerberg exists because of second mover advantage. You know, he was not, Facebook was not first to the social, you know, and, and maybe some younger listeners won't recall, but I mean, there used to be a company called MySpace and there was some, actually some precursors even to that. And Facebook got some key things right, massively correct actually, that caused them to just go to the moon. And, and now those other folks are gone. But I, I, I question, you know, I don't, think necessarily that Facebook would be Facebook if it had launched at the same exact time as MySpace and it was having to l take their lumps in parallel. And and it, it, it just strikes me, I'm not saying this is what's going to happen or even probable, just that it's possible that Facebook is the first mover loser here and that they're paving the way for someone else to be wildly successful because they're taking these multi-billion dollar lumps somebody else isn't going to have to, you know, comes in and, um, you know, sometimes, sometimes time is a flat circle, or I don't know if that actually makes any sense here, but like, you know, there's the, there may be, you know, this thing might come back around and be perfectly symmetrical because they are investing massively, but it, it does seem like he's losing the support of his board, you know, and I, I'm not sure I, 
Godspeed to Meta. You know, at the time of recording, as we sit here today, November 10th, this has been a very difficult week for Meta, you know, and they've they've had their first really large layoff in company history. But I agree, you know, some of the products they're putting out are quality, but there's a very bad narrative around them. So the consensus from non-users is that it's not great. And then you talk to users and they say, this is a really cool product. Yeah, so time will tell. Nathan, thanks so much for being on the show today. This has been great. Yeah, thanks again for having me. It's been uh, great chatting. And thank you for listening. Join us next time as we meet with another IoT executive and talk about what went wrong on a journey that went right.